playing it. So. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are now floating in Screamer Celica. My name's <laughs> Kevin Graham, and as usual, I'm joined by Russell Boyce. Russell, what's happening, my man? Well, it is happening, my man. It's a wee bit more rushed than normal uh, this week, but just to manage, just about managed to get my shirt on in time, Kev. You know, you didn't want me doing these uh, Screamer Celica slots topless, mate. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> I think we'd be strictly audio if that was the case, man. You know I mean? Definitely, definitely. I mean, somebody, somebody says in the comments, yesterday I'll, I'll, I'll look like Tam Cowan, Fletcher. Or either I was trying to be Tam Cowan. You were trying to be him, I think it was. I've seen uh, that. I was trying to be. No, I've got to say the night. Are you trying to be Cat Slater? <laughs> that, that, that's a bit Cat Slater, Bet Gilroy, uh, that shirt. You need to talk us through that one. Ah, oh, just another. I mean, it's the same. It's the same every time, mate. I've had it for years. It's in the archives. I've got. I've got a few to get through for the the Screamer Celica shows. So it's strictly shirts for uh, for uh, the music and Celtic pod, man. Strictly shirts, mate. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> we need the dress code, eh? We actually do need a dress code. No, <laughs> we're back in the DeLorean and we're firing it up to eight eight mile an hour. Yeah, and. We've been hit with the flashing lights and that, and we've ended up back in Uncle Marnock on the 15th of October 2011. So we've ended up in, I think it's a Safeway car park outside Rugby Park, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> uh, some, 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 somebody will keep me right. So we've got out the DeLorean and we're walking to Rugby Park, and as we're walking to Rugby Park, we're already 10 points behind the Mr. Sleekett himself, Ali McCoyst, uh, mm. Rangers. No, Ali McCoy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick on, I'm going to say this, eh? But did you see him doing the video about covering your covering your mouth and talking? Did mm -hmm. you see him doing the video on talk sport about how hypocritical is that? He was the Sleekett get that actually invented that, eh? <laughs> when, he, when, he, when he says it to Neil Lennon, eh? So for him to come on and, and say that, for me, was well out of order. Well, I'll be away for that. So we're 10 points behind Rangers going into this game, and it's an early kickoff. And the Celtic teams went through quite a lot of changes. Neil Lennon's new in his second, second season as manager. And in the summer, we had lost Andreas Hinkle. Great player for me, a quality fullback. Yeah. Freddie Lundberg, we had let Freddie Lundberg go. Never really done much for us, eh? Didn't mention that, man. Didn't mention that's too upsetting still to talk about yet. How did we a sad, whole... It was did, a sad did... day when he left, mate. It was a sad day when he left. He brought did a lot we... to the table. <laughs> he did, aye, he did. <laughs> um, maybe it was cutlery or the, the water in the table. I didn't, didn't bring much onto the pitch. Um, <laughs> who, else, who else left? Darren O'D left. He went to Leeds United. Which Not is strange. Who, eh? strange. Niall McGinn moved to Brentford. Yeah, uh, Sean, Mal that. Sean Maloney had went to Wigan. Uh, Morton Rasmussen. Do you remember Morton Rasmussen? I do. Ra uh, Ra Rasmussen. <laughs> he, he 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 went to Turkey, and use right. Huivid went to Holvild. I think it was Huivid. I know that's how he says it. Was it no who he did? No. no. He, he he went to he went to Southampton. Yes. Which is yeah. a very very strange move. Um, yeah, I never see that in these days. They certainly just go to Southampton. To Southampton no. <laughs> so unusual. <laughs> uh, that was that, that I at that time it was unusual. No any more. So we had brung in Adam Matthews, Kelvin Wilson, Dylan McGeoch, uh Big Fraser had returned for his setting loan spell. Victor Wanyama, Badir El Kadure, Andre Blackman, and later on we actually we, we ended up bringing in uh, Lustig, Ra Rabun, Abraham. I think that says. I can't even oh, remember. Oh, the Israeli centre back. Uh, no, he was uh, he was Nigerian. He was a winger. <laughs> Rabu. Ibrahim, Ibrahim, it was a wee winger, and Pawel Brozic. Yes, yes. He was a he was a Polish striker as well. 
But we're also bringing another striker, and we're going to talk about this other striker later on once we get after this game. We also spent £2.4 million on Mohamed Bangura, which we, need to, which we need to discuss more in depth later on. So we turned up to Rugby Park that day. Um, 6,000 years turned up to Rugby Park that day. And we end up 3 nothing doing at half time. We, over. It's over. We're 10 points behind Rangers with a game in hand. Um, do you remember why we had that game in hand? No. We had that game in hand because we decided to go to Dublin and play Inter Milan in the Dublin Super Cup. A week, a, a week after the season started. The season started earlier because 2012, the Euros in 2012. So we played Hibs in the first game. Then we had a week off because we went to Dublin and played Inter Milan and a League of Ireland select. Yes, yes. We got, we, we got beat 2 0 off Inter Milan and what has been described as a bad tempered game. I can't remember anything about it. I can't even remember watching it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I also played Inter Milan later on, I think, in the, what, what was that tournament? The Champions Cup or something like that. They'd be no play Inter Milan and Galway or. Limerick or Cork years later. I'm sure we did. I'm, I'm talking rubbish now, probably. So, this game, we're going to rugby park. We're 3 nothing doing at half time. This, yeah. this is after getting bombed out by Leon as well. Right? So, no, no, Leon. Sion. It rhymes. It does rhyme. So, I'm, 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 I'm letting myself yeah. away with that. Leon uh, would have been a wee bit more credible, you know? Than Sion. But that got overturned because... They didn't sign up eight, didn't they? Improperly registered player. That's imagine, a good way of putting it. Yes. Imagine a imagine a club getting hammered for having improper for having a improperly registered player. That, that never happens in Scotland, does it? I've never heard of anything, especially I've never heard no. of any punishments getting handed down for that. Come on, that's but, surely no, no. It's especially if it, especially when it lasted about ten years. I mean, <laughs> uh, Imagine improperly registering players for 10 years and not getting punished. That's unbelievable, that, eh? Really? Wouldn't have been here. No, no, the SFA would be on top of that, definitely. So, the Celtic team that day, that's 3 nothing down at half-time, is yep. Fraser Foster, uh, Daniel Mastorovic, Chad Uri, yes. Chad Mulgrew, Adam, Ma Adam Matthews, Joe Ledley, Ki Sung Young, Kyle, Tony Stokes, James Forrest, Gary Hooper. That's the team that started that game. Yep. Now, I've got to admit here, I never saw this game because I was on a plane. I was on a plane flying home from Tenerife, so <laughs> I, I'm up in the sky, not knowing what's going on. And blissfully ignorant, Kev. Blissfully, blissfully ignorant. Blissfully man. ignorant. What was actually happening? What did? What was your? What was your feelings during this game? Oh, I remember it so well because it was actually me who suggested it this week for a wee change, Kev. Because I do think, and we'll go into it all, but just how colossal a, a level of importance I think this game ended up having on so many more levels than just that season, I think, as well. Do you know what I mean? Because it was obviously such a game. We were on the brink. Um, I watched it. I was only into my... So I'd had my own pub for about 15 months by then. And I can remember the girlfriend at the time I took her uh, up the tune shopping in the morning. I was working at night that day. And I remember we went and got McDonald's. And then it's like it was about five minutes before kickoff. So instead of getting like a train back, jumped in a taxi so we could watch it, you know, at the pub. Uh, whilst I did kiddie on, I was doing paperwork or some nonsense like that. Do you know what I mean? I was probably just sampling the uh, the beer, making sure the lines were all good for the for the, the night ahead, you know. Busy weekend ahead, mate. You've got you've got to test the stock stock control, mate. Stock um, control. Quality control, that's it. Quality control, that's it. Um, and, and obviously, it, obviously, before anybody puts it in the comments, you mean you mean the lines of beer and nothing yeah. else. <laughs> Aye, that was the only <laughs> lines I was trying on a Saturday lunchtime with my McDonald's. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> How things come out wrong. Um, yes. uh, you knew all about it. Uh, well, then, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like, I remember at half time just being, you know that way of feeling completely numb 
as to go, I, I don't even know what to say. Like, it's over already. You need to remember, this was so early in the season, 15th of October, and the year before, we'd just been beaten the final day. Okay, Rangers Cup come out the final day the year before, right? But that's when Lennon spoke about, you know, it's not over by a long shot and all that, and then got us all G'd up. And the team the year before had been, they're giving you a lot of belief, haven't they? I felt they had. I know that it was, we probably should have won the league the year before, let's be honest, but that's another conversation as well. I think we really felt, do you know what? See now, like a lot of the players are settled, few additions, we'll romp that because they were an agent side we were against as well. And yet, before you know, October of 10 points behind, some of the new signings already were getting a wee bit of, shall we say, question marks over their head, a wee bit of doubt, such as Chad Uriah, I remember in particular. Um, and was that the season we had the other winger guy? Who was the other winger? Badir El Kaduri. No, he was the, I thought he was a fullback. I'm sure we had like a, a winger sort of forward players. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There was a couple of them getting questioned. But with Castro, was it? Oh no, that was that was that was Dyla. That was Dyla with Castle. Was it? Was, anyway, you know what I mean. Did he know scoring? Yeah, I've not got a clue, man. Did he know that Castle no scoring Salzburg in the two each draw? Scott Lunenbach and Macasso scored in Salzburg in the two each draw on the day of the Scottish independence referendum because I was working at the referendum. So, so I don't know, I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> but aye, so anyway, there was a few of the signings anyway getting some uh, getting some question marks to say, like you know, some questions asked of them. Have they really added to the squad? What's going on here? Lennon's pre the pressure was under Lennon massively. Because he's scored over the two or three windows he's had by then as well. Hadn't he been assembled particularly cheaply? Because we all knew it was big wages he'd paid out to get the likes of your Joe Legley's and stuff. Um, I genuinely felt that day at half time just completely like, you know, that way, like your stomach's flipped a wee bit. I felt sick. I just felt, this is it. It's, uh, it's got to be gone. Um, even And to be honest with you, even at that point, you go, I don't see them drawing, but even if they draw, it's not enough anyway because we're that far behind. We need to, we already, you know what it's like with Celtic and Rangers, Kev. We're going to need to win every game left. <laughs> That's what you're saying back in October. We're mm -hmm. going to need to win every single game, otherwise we won't win the league. Um, for them to turn it back round in that second half, though, was when you realised, I felt anyway, that the players really were playing for Lennon, in fairness, at that, 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 that uh, spell that he had in charge perhaps maybe a wee bit unlike the most recent one. But I certainly felt that the, the, the players were playing for Lennon and that turnaround, it was a, good, a great feeling, but I'll be honest to you, revisionism is something that we spoke about before on this and you look back and, and obviously you do realise, of course, with hindsight, all the different reasons as to why it was so important. But I think my overriding feeling, if I remember correctly, at full time, Kev, was we're still gubbed. <laughs> like, like it's still not like we're not we're not this is no it doesn't I, I know it was great that they've turned it around to a draw but realistically the league's now a real real long shot do you know what I mean you, you would have says that at that point uh, you definitely would have says it at half at, at that point even at full time uh, what Lennon says to them at half time seemingly says to them at half time uh, you're embarrassing the club and I'm going to be out of your job just go out and do what you have to do. That sounds basically what he's been telling the players ever since. Um, <laughs> so they went out, and it's a strange game. It is a strange game because for half an hour, Celtic do nothing. Absolutely nothing. They don't look like getting back into it. You can actually see when you watch the highlights now, there wasn't a big Celtic support there that day anyway. And but no. you can actually you can actually see gaps in the crowd getting bigger and bigger the longer yep. the setting uh, the longer the second half goes on. Roy Crawford, I nearly left at half time for the pub, but the old Celtic dad, if I is kicked in. That's what I love. I love that. I love because I would have been the exact same if I was there. I was, no, I'm staying at the end. I'm, I'm not going to the pub. No. And do, you know, do you know that just touches on as well what Paul John Dykes was saying on uh, one of the Celtic bulletins not just not long ago? Say the beauty of Celtic fans is we do have an amazing ability to sort of. Take the piss out ourselves, you know what I mean? Oh, sorry. Like, but you know what I mean? Like, take the mic out ourselves. We do. Yeah. We've got the ability to do that. Even there, 
you know, that comment there um, um, from the viewer, that's brilliant, Pat. Do you know what I mean? The old Celtic da <laughs> kicked in, and that's why I stayed. Love that. I've been in I've I've been in that a uh, stage state of mind many times myself. I'm not leaving. I'm staying at the end. Um, well, stuff well, stuff well, like yeah. that, it, like four nothing doing at Ibrox and stuff like that. I've, I've actually just stood there and like g- gave them the really? on the way out. Oh, yeah, you can't you can't you can't leave. Eh? <laughs> you can't leave. You can't do that. That's that's against the grain, man. That's that's pure Celtic dapper. <laughs> not, like all these, not like all these youngins who will actually leave at half time and stuff like that and go to the pub. <laughs> Three, two of their goals that day, uh, Big Foster was terrible for two of them. And this was before he became the goalkeeper we all, we all grew to love. Uh, we were in an absolute horrible away kit. That away kit looked like a static telly. It was yellow and like... Uh, Looked, yellow and black, yellow and black. Uh, it looked like a, it looked like a fake bumblebee effort for the nineties, eh? Aye, it was Getting horrible. The joined up the stripes, right? Whoever stitched it all together, you know what I mean? It was terrible. It, it, it was horrible. It was a horrible awake. It one, one of the worst. And when we speak about Tony Stokes after this, there seems to be an awful lot of horrible awake during his period when he played for Celtic. Because when you watch his YouTube videos, he's wearing some horrendous awake <laughs> <laughs> but scoring some great scoring some great goals in them. Um, so Stokes brings us back into the game with a cracking free kick. And he, he scored quite a, a lot of free kicks for Celtic. Uh, more than capable of it. Eh? Uh, he was more than capable. And, and he had that sort of, when he actually took the free kick, he laid right back and he got the ball up and over. Eh? He, mm-hmm. he, he, he had a low centre of gravity. It was almost yep. as if somebody was, somebody was holding him up. He then scored a second one, which was a great strike from about 22, 23 yards uh-huh. out. And by this point, you can actually see the Celtic fans behind it going absolutely mental. And Neil Lennon's out in the touchline shouting, come on, come on, and g- g- it all that, which he, still, which he was still doing this season, actually. And <laughs> we get a free kick. It gets whipped in. Daniel Mastorovic headers the ball across the face of the goal. And uh, Charlie Mulgrew with a half diving header bangs it into the back of the net. It's That's free right. each. It's free each with 12 minutes to go. So now, we're romantic Celtic fans. I'm sure every Celtic fan, apart from me, who's up on a plane at this point, no kenning what's happening. I'm sure if that were, if I was in the ground at that point, I'll be gone. There's 12 minutes left. We're winning this 4 3 no problem. We, we, we've got this. this we, we're Glasgow Celtic. This, this is what. This, this will hurt me. It did, they. <laughs> and, 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 and we were really, really lucky that Paul Heathernan missed an absolute sitter for Kilmarnock in the last minute. He'd scored one of their goals, too, so you would have thought, you know, confidence high. But Aye. I suppose it shows you when you've been 3 0 up and then it's got back to. Th- you're in the, you're, at one point, Kilmarnock players would have been sitting there at half time thinking, we're on the brink here of. One of the most famous results in this club's history. Do you know what I mean? No exaggeration. So with the fans. Three mm-hmm. up at half time, Celtic are on their knees. This could get more, you know? And mm-hmm. it just shows you how much that would not the stuff in it here. Do you know what I mean? When it gets back to the three all, how that can drain not just the team's confidence, but actually the individuals themselves. And um, because like you say, I mean, if that chance put it we'll put it this way, that chance presents itself to him in the first half, what happens? It goes in because he scored an offside goal in the first half. Yeah. He, he, the goal well. was offside in the first half. And he actually, you can see it when he actually scores, he looks at the linesman as if to go, are you actually going to give that goal? Really? Um, I I, he, 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 he looks at the linesman for about a good four or five seconds as he's running away. He's like, are you going to give that offside? Because he was a yard <laughs> offside for that goal. Um, is it over the top, massively over the top, to see Anthony Stokes, with his second half performance, saved Neil Lennon's job. And if it wasn't from Anthony Stokes, Neil Lennon wouldn't have achieved what he achieved at Celtic. Certainly, think Stokes played the biggest part in that second half, Kev. Um, and I certainly don't think it's an exaggeration to say Neil Lennon probably would have been out of job. I, I, mm. I'm struggling to think how he would have, if we got beat 
especially in the manner it was looking like it was going to be. I think it's important to put that in there as well. Because um, we all know how Lennon got the gig. Obviously, when Tony Mowbray got humped, you know, 4 0 or 4 1, whatever it was against St. Mirren. Um, I think if that had carried on going down the road to 3 0, potentially even extended in the second half, for me, there's no way back there. Absolutely no way back. I mean, it'd be sensible given he only won one more point than what he would have if we'd lost. <laughs> if we'd lost, it was only an extra point when, when we really did need all three, such was the gap already. Mm-hmm. But the manner of the comeback, Gave folks the belief, maybe Lennon, maybe they're all still playing for. They're all they're all working together here. This is a unit uh, we all still believe. Um, but I think you've got to be realistic and say whether it was okay. Scott uh, Tony Stokes was the the main catalyst, shall we say, in that second half, definitely. But it's not too far fetched to say Neil Lennon would have been out of job come the Monday. I don't think that's. I don't think that's too far fetched or over dramatising it. And if it is over dramatising it, anyone, that's what we're here today. <laughs> I know, definitely. We're here to revise history and for you, for you lot not to take us too serious. Albert Bramble gets into the mood of this podcast and says, Stokes, Stokes has got a lot to answer for then. Well, <laughs> 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 that's, that's, a very, that's a very good point. Eh? That is a very good point. If you have a look at like Tony Stokes, I mean, that's probably up there as one of these mythical moments where Mark Robbins saving Alex Ferguson at Man United. Alex Ferguson always says, if Mark Robbins hadn't scored that goal against Norwich, was it, and or Nottingham Forest in the FA Cup, he would have been out of job as well. Next thing you know, Ferguson creates a dynasty. But so it is up there with one of one of those goals, and you didn't get. If anybody in the comments has got any more examples of Mark Robbins or Tony Stokes saving a manager's job and they then go on yeah. and precedent his success, let us know. Mark Robbins was the first one that came Mark Robbins was the first one that came to my mind there. But if you have a look at Tony Stokes, when he signed for Arsenal when he was 15, onlookers claimed he was the most talented player ever to come out of Ireland at that point when he signed for Arsenal when he was 16. It's the and Roy well, obviously, Keane, obviously they hadn't seen Paddy McCourt by then in fairness as well. No, no. They obviously didn't know who Paddy McCourt was, so we need to take that with a wee bit of pinch of salt. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that that's what I mean, that's what Wikipedia tell me, because that's the level of my research that goes yeah, into this. Totally. That's what that's what that's what we, Wikipedia tell me. Um also at the time. When Roy Keane was manager of Sunderland, Roy Keane says about Tony Stokes, the player could be a top player or played in Northern League in five years' time. And I think that sums up Tony Stokes' career, that he's always had that ability, but something's never quite happened for him. I mean, he went for Arsenal to Falkirk and won, and he first came to my um, knowledge at Falkirk, where... He scored 16 goals in 18 games for Falkirk, including three hat tricks in a row. He also scored. Was that under John Hughes? Under John Hughes, uh huh. He also scored a goal at a League Cup game at Celtic Park that puts. uh, When Falkirk put us out the League Cup that year, five foreign penalty kicks, we drew one each uh, in normal time, and it was Stokes that scored the goal against Celtic Park. So his loan spell ended in that January, and it looked like he was going to come to Celtic. It really did. It looked like Celtic were going to make the what was going to make the bid and get him. But Stokes followed his Irish influence and moved to Sunderland for two million pounds, where Roy Keane was the manager. Um, he started well do, doing there. He started well doing uh, at the stadium alike because it would have been the stadium light at, at that time. But he ended yeah. up going to Sheffield United on loan. He ended up going to Crystal Palace on loan. And he eventually moved back to Hibs for half a million pounds in August 2009. And, and when he moved back to Hibs, I remember thinking, there's still a player there. He is a, he is a talented, talented football player. So he's only at Hibs a year. He has a, he has a great season at Hibs again. And eventually he makes a move to us uh, for 1.2 million in August 2010. Now, I'm going to read. So, so he was there for five years. 
And I'm going to read what he actually achieved with Celtic because when well, I wrote when I wrote this down, I didn't realise he had achieved so much. He scored 76 goals. He's got four league winners medals, two Scottish Cup winners medals, and one League Cup winners medal with Celtic. He's also got another. Eh? He's also got another Scottish Cup winners medal with Hubs. No, with Hubs. Um, but when you think back on it, I, I, I watched a I watched a YouTube video of Tony Stokes at uh, at Celtic, and. Some of the goals that he scored were fantastic. It's all technique. It's all he always seems to get the ball on the left hand side of the box and cut in on his right foot and stroke it by goalkeepers. He always he's also got that little drop of the shoulder and going in and out of players. And he and he had a great partnership with Gary Hooper. And I think maybe his role is underlooked because we all love Gary Hooper. What do you think of that? Well, I think it's fair. I think Hooper as well was just that bit more prolific. Um, I think Hooper was more capable of scoring a total variety of goals. Well, I think Hooper was able to get in the in the six yard box and scored a lot, probably most close range goals than what Stokes did. But was more than capable outside the box. We always think Stokes' goals. Not that they all would be. I mean, if we went through the archive, I'm sure there's loads of examples to prove me wrong right now. But when you think of Stokes' goals, I'm very much like you. I always think. Uh, the most spectacular sort of goals. Um, and then, one of the funny things about that spell, right, that he said his most successful spell at Celtic, and we talked about a guy whose professionalism is questioned a lot. Do you know what I mean? Or, he, you know, he's lacking, he's not, he's not a good temperament to be, you know, off-field, to be dedicating his life as an athlete and things like that. And yet Neil Lennon was his manager, you know, that period. And it's the exact same stuff that you accuse Neil Lennon in his second spell at Celtic of not being able to, you know, take seriously enough for the, the, the current crop. And yet you've got an example there of someone who's a, a bit of a, you know, someone who maybe doesn't take the, take his career as seriously as he should because of his ability and the talent that he's got. But actually the best he was and the most dedicated he was in the most professional spell of his career, which brought out the best, you know, uh, racial with goals and, and all these trophies that you've just discussed there. It was actually under Neil Lennon, so Neil Lennon deserves credit for that, in fairness. Uh, as, you know, we've got to be balanced sometimes, you know, we've got to give credit where it's due, and fair dues, he's certainly got a fantastic tune out of Tony Stokes, and, you know, they, they seem to work well together, and you can you can kind of see why Lennon wanted to bring him back to Hibs. Of course, it was funny, because when they met up, it was over a pint of Guinness. Remember the photo mm -hmm. in the newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> wow, but uh, no, totally um, underrated, probably to a point. I when you read out everything that you just said, there a wee bit of an unsung hero. It probably was, and uh, it, there's a goal that he scored against Hibs in the in the recycled Bumblebee, which is an overhead kick from the corner of the box, which was a it's an utterly fantastic goal. And there's another, it wasn't there a goal, but remember Shakhtar Karagandi. Champions oh, League, when he breaks into that box and he squares it back for James Forrest to score in the last minute. That's, that's right. some that's some a bit of ability at that point of a game. He played on instinct. He seemed to be yeah. an instinctive player. And maybe that's been his problem that he went when instinct out with football as well, with some things that have actually happened during during his career. See, see just what you were saying there, though, Kev, just a, just a, a wee different, we just slightly different uh, avenue. I know we've, we'll probably go way over the time again, as always. But just saying you were saying there about the, the transfer fees there. Now, I was a wee bit taken aback that he joined Hibs for half a million pounds. I presumed he joined them on a free transfer. Um, yeah, now, what does that say, and why is it that the Scottish clubs you know, people talk about Mickey Mouse League and all that nonsense, or the gap's too big. I actually feel at times Scottish clubs don't help themselves. Why on earth would you invest a huge fee for Hibs, which it is, half a million pounds, the boy absolutely smashes it, and within a year you sell him for just 1.2. Now, people could talk about the percentages of that and whether it's more than double what they paid. Nonsense. We're still talking about 1.2 million pounds, though. Which they are import it is going to be an you know almost an impossibility for them to get a player of that ability again in for that. And secondly, you're selling it to a club that 
let's be honest, are competing for the Champions League. They're entering the Champions League. You're talking about these games back then. They've got money in the bank. They're in the same league as you. I think it's time that Scottish clubs maybe get a wee bit more self-respect with that and start, you know, stop flogging your players for so little because that one doesn't make sense because perhaps to do an outlay of £500,000, that's what's making me think this. If they got him for three fair dues, but if they got him for half a million the year before, he smashes it for a year, why would you sell him to a league rival for only 1.2? It just seems... I, I can't remember round about that time if it, if there was a lot of debating going on, like arguing with Hibs over the fee. I just seem to remember just thinking it was always written in the stars that he was going to play for Celtic and it was a transfer that was always going to happen. And yeah, I get that. But I, I, I do get what you're saying about the transfer fees. I, I, I think clubs, I think clubs sometimes do sell their talent too cheap, and including us in that at, at times as well. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, I think the money when you look at what Aberdeen got for some of their players this season is actually decent money. But you've got to remember that the money that Aberdeen got for what's that big coup a centre half that was always linked to us. Can I remember? Yeah. It was like a, McKenna, he looks like a side of a tractor. Uh, McKenna, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think Aston, Aston, Aston Villa offered um, five, six, six, mil, six million pounds for him last uh, season ago, and I think they ended up getting two or three. So the money is there, and people are looking at Scotland, and yep. you can only and you can only hope that that will be a a, a, domino, a domino effect of Brexit. That the, the Scottish, the English clubs will start looking at the Scottish market for well, talent. Exactly, because it, it might be one that, you know, you've only got so far you can look, guys, you know what I mean? So if you want them, start charging the right dollars. There was one that annoyed me as well, not because we need to go in on it for ages, I just mean like, well, it was always Liam Boyce, I think, had finished top scorer in the SPL, mm -hmm. and he was sold for 500 grand to Burton. Aye. I just thought, 500 grand for your league's top scorer, the Premier League's top scorer. What does that sig what signal is that as well? Not that their responsibility is other clubs, but what does that message send though to the, you know to the clubs that are the vultures down south that are looking up here? If the top scorer of the league is five hundred thousand pounds, you know, what I mean that was even long ago, five years, six years. It's, anyway. it's quite. It's quite weird then eh, that there's a lot of comments coming in about Lee Griffiths and Tony Stokes getting boxed in the same package. And they did form a decent partnership in one season. I think it was 2014. Uh, I used to call it the partnership of receding hairlines because they're probably the two boldest centre forwards that we've ever had who were still in their 20s at that point. And, yeah, there, is a, probably. <laughs> and there is a video with them getting the hair transplant on YouTube. Both of them got a hair transplant at the same time. <laughs> there is a video on YouTube I, I, I'm, I'm not making that up so Stokes left in June uh, 2016 and he went to Blackburn on a free and I think Paul's put up he's had five clubs in three years and only played 37, 37 games, games. Wow. 37 games since he's left Celtic five clubs in three years since leaving Hibs he has played 37 games in that period. So there you go. Um, and do you know something as well? He must have been his peak then as well. 29, 30, 31. I know. He's probably been 31, 32 then. He's 32 just now. He's, he's 32, 32 just now. There you go. That season, Celtic also signed Mo Bangura from IAK Stockholm. <laughs> and so Mo Bangura comes with a, not a massive reputation, but a highly decent YouTube video a great YouTube video, which I recently watched, and he's got everything. He's got pace, he's got power, he, he can score in there, he can score for the edge of the box, he can out-muscle defenders, he can play defence-splitting defense passes. He's got the lot, and he's got the ball there, a middleweight boxer. So, like, and he's also come to us recommended by the King of Kings, allegedly. So, he turns up, turns up to Celtic Park in his first interview. He's talking about only being here a year, then going to Spain or England because he's going to smash the league up. He's going to be absolutely great. And uh, and he was like, hey, fantastic. <laughs> the interview is there. What's the interview? Right. He's talking about going to La Liga. He's talking about going to uh, England within a year. So the guy had confidence. He really believed in himself. He left 
Celtic after only playing 16 games and scoring one goal in a friendly against Stoya Bucharest. Now, at that time in front of him, you had the Hooper-Stokes partnership. But really, he didn't really show anything whatsoever in a Celtic jersey. He came on a couple of times as a sub. I, rem I, remember, an absolute I remember a game where he was that bad he actually went to mark a defender that was being subbed off the park. He ran after the defender, thinking the keeper was going to put the ball on him, and the, and the defender was getting subbed. That's amazing. That is a true story. That is a true story. He, 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 he wasn't. He wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> he just like he just, just chased this boy. Oh, um, that's very good. I heard the story though that apparently it was not his brother that was the good one. No, no, no. That's 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 another one of these myths that we've got to like dispel. Uh, he played up front with another Bangura, Tita Bangura, uh, and they had a great partnership. And um, both of them had, had a fantastic. They looked completely different. They looked completely different. They didn't they look alike. And everybody says, oh, we had signed, we had signed the wrong Bangura. That, that was a, a, that's a load of rubbish. Strangely enough, Tita Bangura's 31 and hasn't had a team since 2017. And Mo Bangura hasn't had a team since 2018 and is only this 31. Boy, homework, this boy, and is only 31 as well. So... Tony Stokes is 32, has they got a team as well. So there's maybe something about strikers at Celtic at that period, which, which sees them go off the rails and no get no play into the former part of their careers. Some great comments came in, and I'm going to actually go back to one of them. Somebody mentioned Stefan Skefovic, and somebody mentioned Amido Baldi. I would say Bangura on paper is worse than them because Skepovic scored a couple of first team goals in competitive games, as did Abido F and Baldi, who scored a great goal against Liverpool in a friendly and also a day I'll never forget at Fur Hull when he I think he's steam steam steamrolled through the defence and scored a fantastic goal. So I would say Bangura is probably worse than those two, just because yeah. of the fact that they actually scored a competitive goals for Celtic. Timo Puke, no, nah, he scored a competitive goal for Celtic as well and has went on to have a decent career. Schiefje, my well, he was fantastic. He was fantastic um, for Dundee United. I don't know again where he is just now. Uh, did he not play for Motherwell a couple of years back? I think he did. I think he played for Motherwell a, a couple of years back. Barca Boy says, where's Bio in that chat? Well, we can't really review Bayo because he's still our player. He's so, still in Toulouse. Toulouse uh, scored under the week. So the chances are he might come back. Uh, Ian McIntosh says Mark Anton Fortuny. I'm not having that. Fortuny was a decent player as well who went on to play for Wigan for three seasons after he left us. So he has done a Bangura and completely different... different uh, completely disappeared. Bangura ended up going back to uh, Sweden. He, he also played against us in a Champions League qualifier against Ellsberg. And Ellsberg were completely utter bombs regarding that and actually made him play. And I remember that night at Celtic Park, the Celtic support absolutely booed him. And strangely, <laughs> and strangely enough, he had a decent game that night. He had a decent game over the two legs against Celtic when he played for Ellsberg. Um, so Bangura's another one of these many project signings that have never been that have never turned out for Celtic. Yeah, can you move on? Never. The, the list is endless. The list is endless. Sometimes you look at that. You know the name that you said there that really got me was Skepovic. Skepovic. Stefan Skepovic. I forgot about him. Signed from a La Liga B team. Uh, yes. Like a Real Al Sunday. Al was it? Or Al Bikete or something? It could well be. I, and I'm sure he's probably back. I'm, I'm sure he left us and went back to the team that we that we signed him on. Aye, um, no, 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 you and boy Martin, I'm going to say this, he, call, he, he comes in with Wayne Biggins. And so, aye. Biggins, but what I'm actually going to say is Jim Orr, who's on on a Friday with us, eh, he calls us the Wayne Biggins world show. 
uh, for all these 90s kids out there who remember Wayne's World. So he calls me and Russell, he calls Schema Selica the Wayne Biggins World. So if you find that funny, I found it funny. Right, Paul comes in with Skefovic's dad played for Partizan Belgrade when we drew six each with them. That which is true. And Ivan Golak was a manager of uh, Partizan oh, wow. that, that, that night as well. That was the Dundee United boss, wasn't it? So there you go. Quickly, because we want to get to the music. Quickly. If Tony Stokes doesn't turn it round and we lose to Kilmarnock that day, if Paul Hefferman scores in the last minute and we do get beat, what do you reckon would have happened next? Who do you think the next Celtic manager would have been? Now, before you go into it, or no, when you go, go into it, who was the next Celtic manager going to be? Roberto Martinez. <laughs> right. So, irony being, he would be the absolute dream appointment uh, now. And in 2011, Roberto Martinez was probably slightly unfancied by a large section of the Celtic support who I, from my memory anyway, believe a lot of them probably thought Owen Coyle would be maybe a better bet for the Celtic gig than uh, Roberto Martinez. <laughs> Which is frightening. Uh, Martinez, I believe, was just working his magic at Swansea at the time. He had moved to Wigan. As he just moved to Wigan, he so he's got he, uh, he left... Uh, Swansea. He Swansea up, he'd been there League 2, League 1, he left in the Championship in a playoff spot, I think, when Rodgers took over. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure what the timeline was there. Um, but he'd certainly left the foundations for uh, Mr Rodgers to take over and have, you know, oh, and do it, but on bread, Rodgers capitalised on it, but that is, you know, that's a, a T, you can imagine him doing that. Um, but I think at that point, Martinez's work at Swansea well, isn't it funny because you could probably argue it's the same arguments probably get made about someone like Eddie Howe. He's only worked at Bournemouth. He's only worked through the leagues at that. I think people are forgetting, you know, what what legacy he's leaving at the clubs, what future proof planning he's made at those clubs, what terms of their mindset, what their whole football and philosophy is going forward, the brand of football, the youth setup, you know, everything that he was involved in. Uh, these clubs. I mean, he'd really set the foundations, I think, for Swansea to go on to become an English Premier League club for the what, I think it was seven, eight, nine years maybe that Swansea were up there for. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, seven years? Seven? Sounds about right. Um, I certainly think he played a huge part in that. Um, and I think it is easy to turn your nose up at the time at this sort of thing. But you're in leagues, remember, I think people forget down there that have, even in League Two, Clubs that are spending more money than some of the SPL teams. Not all of them. Half of them say. You get to League One and you're looking at the now the vast, vast majority of League One teams are spending more money than almost all the SPL teams. You know what I mean? Bar now three or four. Um, in these leagues are 24 teams. The competition is fierce. It's a slog, the, that league. An absolute the room, the room for error, Kev. Is where folk forget how that's the margin for error. You think, what is it they say about how many players are in a free? I, I, I look at all this stuff that are free agents in the summer, right? In England, it's like sometimes they're saying like 20% of the or 30% even of like actual PFA members are on the free. You think how easy it would be to sign five players that turn into duds in that sort of environment when you're working your way out of there, or in the, or the flip it, how difficult it is to turn them into gems. How difficult it is to turn guys like Leon Britton into the player that he was? That's his name, eh? The Swansea, <laughs> Swansea midfielder. All like that. And he did it with a Dutch boy as well, Ferry Bode. I remember Martinez had completely turned him into a phenomenal midfielder. And he, he was just uh, hampered by injury. And I just think in those leagues, we need to be a wee bit open, more open-minded than that. If it had been a how who got the job, I don't see it now because I think he would have been hired by now, to be honest to you. Um... But we shouldn't be up, you know, above or, or turning our nose up at achievements and working your way up through those leagues. And um, particularly if you're doing it in the brand of football that Martinez was, because it's so ballsy to do that in those leagues. Over a 46 game season, you're just mm -hmm. playing total football, if you want to call it that, and it's working. And you're promoting youth, 
and you're playing. It's just it was amazing what he did there, um, and to think that you know a lot of fans would have preferred Owen Coyle is just madness. And you know you fast forward ten years, what will be saying about Eddie Howe in ten years? It's just a like for like example. By the way, I'm not saying it'll be the same. If Eddie Howe's in charge of Belgium in ten years, <laughs> then wow. Now what you've got to remember is before we appointed Tony Mowbray, we offered Martinez the job in two thousand and nine. But he decided to move to Wigan. And so he was two years into the Wigan project when Lennon, if mm-hmm. Tony Stocks hadn't saved Dale Lennon, would, uh, would have got sacked. So we're two mm-hmm. years into that. And I was having a look back to see who was on the list when we appointed um, Tony Mowbray. Because we still would have been working for that same, same list two years later. Eh? And it absolutely... It absolutely seems that we're still working for the same list when you actually see the names that were linked in 2009 to the names that are currently currently being linked. It makes me think that Dermot has got this folder, can one of the like peach based ones, like cardboard, <laughs> eh? and it's in, a yeah, fil- right? it's in a filing cabinet, and and, and uh, it's in his filing cabinet and, and his London getaway and he goes up every so often and he gets his folder and he goes, right, Roberto Martinez, Roy Keane, Owen Coyle. What are they doing now? Because Roberto Martinez and Roy Keane have been linked with the Celtic job every time since 2009. So it, it, must, it must be the same list. They must be just having a look at the same list. Um in 2009, I'm going to say, if the Lennon had been sacked at that point, I reckon the Celtic support would have accepted Roy Keane at that point. I really thought, uh, 2011, I reckon they did. He was at, uh, he was at Aston, uh, no, he was at Ipswich at that point. He could still love off winning the championship with Sunderland and having a decent run in the English Premier League with him. He's went to Ipswich. Ipswich are a basket case of the club. They're loaded with debt. And he eventually leaves Ipswich in June 2012. So he was already at nearly at the end of his tether. I think if Celtic would have offered Roy Keane the job at that point, he would have took it. And the mm-hmm. Celtic support would have accepted it. Mm-hmm. But we all know that didn't happen. Tony Stokes saved Neil Lennon. And this is, this is what I'm going to say. This is completely off topic. But we end up going top of the league, I think, when we beat Rangers on the 29th of 28th of December. Uh, Joe Ledley scored the header. I think, we ended, I, I think we ended up going top of the league at that point. 28th of December. And What's that one around that, is it? It is. And I reckon I met you on the 28th of December 2011. Reason being, I watched that game in your pub. Did you? I watched that game in the Crooked Arm. I was at a wedding along the road and I left the wedding to come and watch the football. <laughs> That's amazing. And I, that and, I, a... and I reckon you probably threw me out, but there you go. <laughs> really? No. Nah, no. Nah. I'm, not, I'm only winding you up, but I reckon that was the first time I wow. because if anybody is again, I've never met Boise in real life. I've only met him virtually. But I think that night I would have at least spoke to you. Definitely you would have. A hundred percent. That came back to me. That came back to me when I was a uh, I would have been there hundred percent. Well, I would a hundred percent have been there, like hundred like no two ways. You know, remember a group of guys in Celtic cults watching the football, no? <laughs> you know no. what I mean? I know they, we're going to go on the music in a minute, man. But I could, honestly, I could do my memoirs in those six years, pal. You know what I mean? I'm telling you. <laughs> I get pops with that look in, man. <laughs> <laughs> Lust for life, mate. Lust for life. Right. <laughs> music, 49 minutes. This seems to be the hang let's get, Let's get to music. This gets to music. Right. Um, Number one in the charts on the 15th of October was Sam Allardyce's favourite song, We Found Love by Rihanna. <laughs> um, number two, reminds me of you, mate, Moves Like Jagger by Maroon 5. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. I, that's one of those songs I sang it as soon as I seen it in the, in the list of the charts, though, eh? I did I sing it straight away as soon as I said that bastard. That's, that's stuck in my head, man. Straight that's away. Bromance, aye, aye. aye. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. 
<laughs> ε, <laughs> ε, number one album was The Awakening by James Morrison. I'm not too sure if that the I'm not too sure if that was the James Morrison who played for West Bromwich Albion in Scotland. And number two <laughs> in the charts was 21 by Adele. Again, pass. Strangely enough, there was a couple of old albums in, in the charts at that time. At number 11 was Nevermind by Nirvana. It must have been re-released for some reason. Uh, number one, number ones by The Beatles was also in the charts. And at number 26 was the classic, classic Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. <laughs> now, Russell, to everybody listening here, you listened to Dark Side of the Moon for the first time this afternoon. <laughs> I we, had to, we had to, we say, Steve, you, you've got to listen to this album. Well, I say, Steve, you've got to listen to that album. I put, so, on the, I put on the good headphones, man. I was like, right, give them their due, get the marshals on. I was like, right, get engrossed in this, man, while I make my lunch. And um, the first track was like a minute long, and I quite like that. They're making a vibe here, I get it. Track number two, man, all I could picture was Ross Geller and Friends, man, when he got his keyboard out. He starts making all the noise, and he doesn't no, know what he's doing. Oh, man. <laughs> I know that's gonna break folks' hearts, but that was the that was the I was just picturing going, eh, making me noises. I was like, come on, get it. And then after that, I thought there was a tune that was the third song was like it was a bit slower paced, but it was a good melody to it, and I thought, fair enough. Um but on for me, I don't know, man. I don't know, I just think they're trying to be a bit too hard, eh, if I'm being honest with you. Oh Russell. It's sell 45 million copies. Now, can sometimes that means... Uh, does they mean... Uh, that you can't good. do that argument both ways. Uh, I can't. I can, it does it sometimes mean the al album good. But I agree with somebody actually says... It, uh, who was it? Who was it? Where is it? Where is it? Somebody says it's not even Pink Floyd's best album. I agree with that. Pink Floyd's best album is... David Kelly, there it is. Uh, Pink Floyd's best album is Wish You Were Here. For me, this at me and well, the I was hoping that was going to be on it. Eh? I was kind of looking for that. Eh? <laughs> I, right. like, I might just skip to that one because I know it. So, that side of the moon is a concept album, and I love these albums. And me, you, and Paul were discussing this earlier on, eh? and I get right into albums. I love albums, and you're going, no, I, just, I just like playlists and stuff like that. I just like songs, but. That side of the moon is, talks about the human experience, man. It talks about, like, conflict, grief, time, death, and sanity, and you can hear that on it. And see, by the time brain damage comes on, the setting song for the end, Russell, the setting mm -hmm. song for the end, if you're not punching the air and the hairs are not standing, on the back of your standing up on the back of your neck, for me, you're clinically dead. They're sucking up <laughs> you if, 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 if that doesn't happen, eh? I, I listen to that side... Um, First time I, I saw it, um, Pink Floyd had a live album called Pulse, and it was a live video at that time. And did they, did they do it live, like in front of folk, with the hide behind the curtain, or what was the script then? Uh, no, they'd done it live, and this was this was filmed in nineteen nineties. This this video, um, and but they did, but they did actually did Dark Side of the Moon a year before the year before it was released. They'd done it live, and there is actually right. a, there, there is actually a bootleg kicking about in the dark side of the moon before they actually went to Abbey Road and recorded it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it was Pulse, that's what it was called, and like they'd done a dark side of the moon like segment of life, and I went like that. Wow. Wow, that's unbelievable. That's absolutely great. I love this album. See, listen to that. I listen to it today again, eh? It yeah. is... Absolutely fantastic, and one and for me, one of the great some bits are a bit weird. No, I've, obviously, it's 1973, mate. They're all taking psychedelics, they're all like really? it's like space rock, it's Hawkwind, it's it's meant to Aye. be, but it's no, it is 
prog. It's probably the start of prog, but it's no Emerson, Lake and Palmer prog where it's 25 minutes dressed as wizards, wizards standing underneath waterfalls playing a keyboard. <laughs> it's, 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 it's no that. It's, it's no that prog. Eh? Um, but I can't believe today is the first day, the, the only time that you ever heard the dark side of the moon. I knew some of the tunes then, eh? right? They've been played in my jukebox and all that. Do you know what I mean? And I've kind of like... Well, that's what, that, that, that's, that's what I was about to say to you. Like, surely you had Dark Side of the Moon on the jukebox. Ah, the like, when both were getting carried away when they were drunk and that, I'd be like going, aye, man, tune, man, like that. Do you want another beer, mate? You know what I mean? Just like kind of like <laughs> humouring it a wee bit. And so I did recognise a couple of the tunes. I did, that's honest truth. Um... I'm the I'm the guy on the I'm the guy who goes to the jukebox and puts on us and them because it's seven minutes long just to get my money's worth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, by the way. People do that. People do that, definitely. That is Zinko, so true. Zinko comes in, us and them is fantastic. On the run on acid is truly frightening. Ah, uh, well, well, we'll take your word for that, Zinko. We won't take your word for that. So well, you go back and listen to any. I, I recommend that you go back and listen to all the Pink Pink Floyd back catalogue. Go to Wish You Were Here next. But for me, Dark Side of the Moon is great. No, I get it, man. Well, I don't get it, but I, like I get where you're coming from. It's obviously it's important music. It's got a bigger place in society with all the amount of sales it's got and all that. And obviously, it's got it's you know. It's got it's an adoration from a lot of people in that. But I mean, I don't know. I'm maybe just I'm just maybe like a wee right simpleton mind when it comes to stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? I just I felt a lot of it went over my head as to what you doing. That is just like at times it was like, well, I don't know, no, nah, I don't know why they're doing that. But I wasn't trying to be negative. I just no, thought I, was, I was like, <laughs> hey, play the tune or no? <laughs> Come on. It's, it's it's one it's 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 one of those albums that has to be played from start to finish. I don't think yeah. you can. I don't think you can dip in and dip back out yet. Sure. Uh, it's one of those. If you want to get its full full width and its mm -hmm. full sonic beauty, then you've got to actually listen to it from start to finish. But a decent pair of bins on and get on with it. I think sure. you need to actually do that. And that's the same way a lot of the Pink Floyd stuff. Plus. Rogers Waters, who wrote the majority of that album, is a big ton. He, he, was, he backed up the Green Brigade a couple of years ago and showed the Palestine uh, oh, really? protest, protest uh, as his backdrop on his recent live solo tour as well. Eh? If you know your history, Russell, have you heard Tommy? That's a rock opera, mate. Tommy by The Who. Um, again, I went to see The Who and I really loved the, the, the bit that they done with Tommy. Eh? I would. I, I'm not really a great Tommy fan, but I'm a massive Quadrophenia fan, which is also a, ro mm. a, a rock opera. Eh? I'm a massive Quadrophenia fan is mm. uh, a, an album as well. Right, that's enough. Enough for me with my old fuddy duddy dad music. Uh, what album are you picked? That was it at that point. I'm a one trick pony, Kevin. I mean, I'm going to get found out on this show. You know what I mean? I'm going to be resorting to all sorts just to try and know a few songs on an album. Um, I mean, the disclaimer is, I don't actually listen to albums. You know, I just wanted to get on the show, guys. That, that's all it was. And now we're in week four. They can't get rid of me. So I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I went for No Gallagher's High Um debut album, which I know we did. We talked about Oasis a couple weeks ago, but this was obviously a big, bold move because it was Noel Gallagher's decision to leave. Still probably the biggest rock and roll band in Britain at the time. In fact, well, um, he wanted to leave. And obviously he thought there was a hunch that he had songs up his sleeve that he had grown sick and tired of giving like half of them for his brother to sing. Do you know what I mean? I think I think his uh, ego got the better of him at the time. I think he forgot that his most successful album, his debut album, was all sang by Liam. So he wanted anyway a piece of the pie. Um... And the album itself, it was it was weird because I actually think it was exactly what the next Oasis album would have just sounded like, probably. Um, just with Noel singing the songs instead of, instead of Liam. I think uh, there's two tracks on it that really stood out when we were listening back to that this morning. And that was the opening track, which is uh, 
everybody's oh, on the run. Aye, everybody's on the run. I mean, what a tune that is. He uses the crouching choir, I think it is, at that point as well, to great effect in the background. He ended up playing quite a lot live with them. I think they'd played with Oasis live for the Electric Proms, and then he mm. kept them for for recording that song. But Everybody's on the Run is an amazing tune. Uh, and then If I Had a Gun, which I think is, to me, what I want to hear when I listen to Noel Gallagher. I want to hear Noel Gallagher doing Noel Gallagher songs. I'm not interested in him broadening his horizons for the sake of it and wearing dog tags and that and shaking his hips these days. I mean, it's just embarrassing. Uh, I want to hear him do songs that sound like him that he's good at and if I had a gun for me uh, it's just just a perfect stereotypical no Gallagher song it is very best there's a good lines in it and stuff like that when he talks about eyes have always followed you around the room I'm like that's just good mate I actually when you listen to the album though it's very much a game of two halves Kev a bit like you know the same sport Celtic play I think uh, the first half of the album is extremely strong I do feel for me it fades a wee bit uh, the second half of the album and stop the clocks i don't know if you remember they called the greatest hits the it's called the greatest let's stop the clocks and it was all based on they were going to throw this track in as part of it because no gallagher had had this faith in this song for years and years was going to be boom stop the clocks was going to be this huge no gallagher tune and it was a it was a major major disappointment um <laughs> Uh, for me, there's a lot of stuff on that um, on his debut album that um, you can actually hear Liam singing. I mean, what a life! But yeah, I can just picture Liam singing that. Um, and there, there, there's a couple, there's a couple of times that um, you hear him. You just, you just want Liam to come in and wrap it up. Um, I think that, I think that's right. I think that was missing from it at times, and it was it was really interesting because I remember I was engrossed at the time. Uh, well, still am to an extent, do you know what I mean? But I think it was really intriguing to see what they were going to do. And you're reading every interview between the two at the time because you wanted to know what the mindset was at the time and uh, what their state of mind was and uh, and all that. And uh, I remember Liam Gallagher saying, he's talking about, you know, wanting to be in his own new musical journey or whatever he says. And, and Liam goes, I've heard half them songs. <laughs> he's not on any new musical journey. He's been rehearsing them and doing sound checks for years. A lot of them. So he wasn't quite reinventing himself as I think as much as what no way to kid on he was. I think it probably was just a case of I've got good enough songs for Oasis, but it'd just be nice for me to sing them myself. Whereas now he's been, you know, not that we're talking about that, but now he's. I mean, I don't know. I think some of his new stuff's been. Oh, I just I mean, just stop, mate. Just cut that nonsense right out. You know what I mean? That's just not happening. Um, I've I've been I've been recorded the same. And I'm not going to deny this now. I've been recorded as saying that I reckoned every BDI album was better than Noel's solo stuff. And mm -hmm. I did say that. But me and Paul were going to do something and it probably will still happen. And we went back and revisited all those albums. And I must admit, I've got a greater um, appreciation of the Noel solo stuff now than probably what I did have a couple of years ago. But yeah. I agree with you. But I agree with you that his first solo album is a bit like um, a lot of the later Oasis albums. First great half, then it tails yeah, right yeah, off. Yeah. At the it's it's that yep. Tails right off at the second half. I mean, if we go go back to the dark side of the moon, they actually realise the dark side of the moon ends with a heartbeat both sides because you used to well you got the LPs there's a heartbeat on both sides because it's about the human condition. So there, there you go, go man. There, there you go. I so like that, that man. No, so that's that, good. I like so, that I, 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 it was a good time man. I mean I think when you look back as well, it probably got I think stuff like that it's easy to slate it because they're there to be shot at people like that. Do you know what I mean? Like they're that big that they that, you know there was nowhere he could go. No guy was never gonna he was never going to go, oh, by the way, do you know what? Genuinely, I think this is better than definitely. Like, maybe no. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It was always going to be compared, contrasted, and then I think at that point he was winning the PR war massively. Um, I think he was coming over. I think he'd, he'd, I think he'd, I think he'd uh, created a narrative that didn't exist in reality, but he had everyone, all the media, like Gordon Smart, all those idiots, do you know what I mean? I don't actually think he's an idiot, by the way. I've spoke to him a few times, his sound. But, I mean, they were so far up his backside, do you know what I mean? That 
they, you know, he was just telling them anything, you know, oh, I couldn't go on another day from your wee brother. Oh, shut up, man. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I feel so threatened in that. Give, give me peace. I've got a wee brother five years younger than me. You know what I mean? I, I never, ever oh, I feel like, oh, this is all too much. And me and the family are really worried about him. And they're like, calm down. It's just nonsense. You, know I mean? you don't need to go that far. You could have just said, I want to, I want to have a solo album and bolt. You know what I mean? Aye, I, um, I'll go through some of the comments here. Uh, you and Boy Martin, Oasis or the Stone Roses, Russell? Oasis by 10 million, million miles. They didn't bottle it. Uh, I'm the Stone Roses. I've got lyrics in my, my arms of the Stone Roses. So I'm a Stone Roses man. Have you ever, uh, the Dude Abides says the band, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. You ever heard that? Say that again? The, the Dude Abides, that's the name of the guy in the comments, he says, have you ever heard the band doing The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down? The Night They Old Drove Old Dixie Down rings a bell. Uh -huh. That's I ringing a bell. It's a fantastic song. The band were Bob Dylan's backing band. And, oh. and they're worried, there's an album, actually, my dad, who put me on to the band. The, the band are fantastic. I would recommend anybody that's never listened to the band, go and listen to that, the, the band... Oh, what was the name? The Last Waltz. Hey, that the, the, producer the is Waltz. so biased. It's unreal. Look at every comment he's putting up. Stone Roses, Stone Roses. Big Sam da. Huh? The, the Roses sold oh, out. I, 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 disagree, disagree. I don't know if anybody, I don't know if Paul brung up the comment there, but the other show that the um, State of Mind does is the Salt and Sauce show. And as Paul says, by the way, Bez is on the salt and sauce chat show this Friday. So that is legendary. So I mean, so boat watching right. this, boat watching this, you've got to say, Kev, do you know what I mean? Like boat watching this show right now, if they like that, there's only one place to be Friday to, to see an interview with Bez on this platform as well. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. The roses are overrated. I think that I'm, I'm not having that. I would argue all day about the stone roses. Um, I've I've seen Oasis double figures. I've seen Oasis, and yeah. when I saw when when I saw the stone roses at Glasgow Green, I've never seen such reverential uh, greeting of a band. It was almost like a religious experience. I've seen Oasis send crowds mental, but I've never been never been. I've never felt that. I don't, I don't Here, here's my argument, right? Here's my argument. I remember saying this before. Say whatever records the Stone Roses created when they did that reunion gig, Oasis will obliterate them. And that's only by being away half the time. And see if you want to talk about greeting and all that, trust me, it will be tenfold. Tenfold, especially with the songs that Oasis will be singing, the way you see it at Glasgow Green. That will be the that'll be when that, that debate gets completely just destroyed once and for all when they come back they, they'll come back compared to the stone roses one and the stone roses one was a record-breaking one those records will be absolutely blown to pieces man i'm telling oh, you I, I, i'm not going to deny that because but it's going to be the majority of the same folk that are going to go to bay for them um if it ever happens i mean there is there, there is a there is a rumor that they've set up a production company oh, which I think is probably more to do with a Freddie Mercury type biopic than uh, than an, an actually get together. Um, I don't know if, if the what right final question final question before we end. If Oasis got back together, what's your lineup? For me, it would be the older one. Eh? But I think Andy Bell and Noel Gallagher can't work together anyway. I think that's done. I think the comments they've made about each other since. It's quite obvious they had the real problem as well. Um, Game Archer's jumped from both ships, so he'll be in. <laughs> There's no two ways. I mean, Game Archer's seems to be all their best pals. Um, and I don't think Liam would do it without Bonehead. And I think Bonehead's got... I think the good thing about Bonehead is Bonehead always had the ability to tell no to shut up. I think that's definitely what's needed. I think Bonehead goes, shut up, mate. You know what I mean? Leave it out. And I had a wee bit of respect. Do you know what I mean? Um... But I think I, I agree with the original lineup. I would rather that, but with Alan White on drums, by the way, instead of uh, the original drummer. No offense to him because he's booked very good. But I cannot see a way that Gem doesn't worm his way into that. I don't see how. 
because he's played with both of them, like BGI, High Fly, and Bugs a lot. So I, I, I think he would be involved somehow. I think they've got a problem because I don't think Gwigs would do it. I, I, I don't think Gwigs is who stays in London. And me and Paul were told a story by uh, who was it? Paul will come in and tell me who recorded an album in Gwigs' studio in London, and he's basically a, rec a recluse. He, he doesn't. He doesn't do any. Uh, he, do, he doesn't. Paul oh, Quinn. Paul Quinn recorded an album with Gwigs, and he basically doesn't do any. He's not interested in doing anything to do with. It's a shame though, because it obviously, I mean, see for me, someone like me it doesn't. I don't get that because I'm just like, I was getting to be playing with that many folk too, right? I would be all over it like in a second. It wouldn't be too much for me, but. It did seem in the 90s that he'd had to have a break and all that at one point as well. And everyone's different, eh, I suppose. But for me, I'd be like, how many folk are playing? How many folk are going to be there, sorry? How much money? I'll see you there. I'll be there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that wouldn't bother me. That's, I would love that. Money usually talks, eh? You could probably have, you could probably have a, you could probably have them playing numerous nights with different lineups, playing an album each night or a set each night with different lineups. That's not bad. You could do that, you could do that. Well, that's us an hour and ten minutes, and this has been fantastic. I, I've enjoyed talking about Tony Stokes, enjoyed talking about Mo Bangura. Uh, there's been some strikers thrown in there that we would rather forget. I've enjoyed talking about the music, and me and Russell will see you. We'll see you again here next week at half past six on a Tuesday night, but we'll also see you for the Monday bulletin. And take care, everybody. Don't be an arse.